Hello, YouTube. I'd like to discuss a topic that is somewhat controversial, at least among some people, which is how straight a guitar neck should be. Should it be straight? Should it be curved? And uh, if so, how curved? Why should it be curved or not? So let's start with an analogy. Let's say that the bridge is the stage in a theater and the frets are rows of seats in this case each seat has six people in it the last frets are actually the first seats in the theater and the first frets are the last seats the nut is the standing room only row behind the last seats so in order for everybody to see the stage, assuming that light travels in a straight line, and I know we're going to leave Einstein out of it, let's just say light travels in a straight line. Um, in order to see the stage, all the seats can be laid out in a perfectly flat plane. And in order to see the stage, we just raise the stage up a little bit, or we can leave the stage on a plane with the seats and just tilt the plane of the seats up a little bit. Raising the stage or tilting this plane does exactly the same thing. It lets everybody see the stage. Now, we're assuming that everybody's the same height, same hairdo, and no hats. So let's introduce um, a few problems into the situation let's introduce the equivalent of a low or a high fret which would be a person say say a person in the third fret puts a hat on he's going to block the person behind him he'll probably also block the person behind them might even block the people in the standing room only he'll have no effect on everybody closer to the stage they can't see him but he might block the light for the people behind him now let's say we want to raise the stage so the people behind him can see well we've got a very long distance here so we're gonna to have to raise this pretty far to effectively raise this enough for people to see if the person who puts the hat on is positioned up here He'll block a lot of people behind him, but people further behind might not even notice that he put a hat on, depending on how high the stage is. And if we want to give clearance to the people right behind him, we can raise the stage a little, because this is a smaller leg of, um, of the lever. So if the fulcrum is here and we raise this here, it's going to come up more than if the fulcrum is here and we raise this the same amount, then it would come up here. So, what if a short person comes into the theater? Well, if a short person sits anywhere, all he's going to do is block himself. Nobody ahead of him or behind him is even going to notice because he doesn't block anybody, but he may have trouble seeing. And again, the same rule for raising it. If there's a short person up here, we don't have to raise it very much for him to see, but if he's back here, we may have to raise it quite a bit. Now, this is all well and good for straight lines, but now let's let Einstein into the theater and let the lines curve, or in fact, let's just go to a string. When a string is at rest, it's pretty close to straight, but it doesn't stay straight when you pull it. When you pull on a string or pick a string, whatever, um, you're stretching the string. It becomes an elastic pendulum. It's fixed at both ends. It bows out wherever you pick it, and then it becomes an elastic pendulum. You pull its mass out against its elasticity, and when you release it, the elasticity pulls it back to the center point, but the momentum keeps it going past that point where it stretches the string again, and it eventually the elasticity overcomes the momentum and it comes back and each time it does that it loses a little energy and diminishes in its amplitude 
and eventually stops vibrating. So um, while it's vibrating, it's executing some kind of a curve. We don't need to know the exact nature of that curve for now, but what we do need to know is that in a theater where light travels in curved lines, the optimal configuration for the seats is no longer flat. It now becomes a curve. And now we have to leave the theater and go to the guitar. Um, the curve in the guitar is typically controlled by the truss rod. Um, it's influenced by the string tension. And it's very small amount of curvature. The reason we need that curvature for the vibrating string not to buzz and um, to explain how the high and low fret situation works, I'm going to um, use another sort of analogy. I've got a, a curved fretboard here and I've got Kind of exaggerated string. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't bend, so we're just going to have to imagine that it bends. Um, at any rate, when you have a properly curved fretboard and you pluck a string really hard, it crashes into the frets, which limits its travel, comes back up off the frets, and then it vibrates. Now, if you do that on a fretboard with no curvature, or worse yet, maybe even backwards curvature, but no curvature would do the same thing. What happens is, as it crashes into the frets, it hits one fret after another, and then it comes back up, and when it comes back down again, it may hit a few less frets, but it's still banging on the frets, and you're gonna hear that as fret buzz. This elastic pendulum is going to be banging on the frets. What if there's a high fret? Well, the elastic pendulum is going to bang on one fret. Let's say my thumb over here is the high fret. The string's going to come down, it's going to hit that high fret, then it's going to come down and crash into a bunch of frets. Then it's going to spring back up, still on that fret, and then it's going to come off that fret. It's going to come back down, hit that fret, and keep doing that, and that bouncing off that fret, that is a fret buzz. It would be the same for a high fret as if maybe you had positioned the, the, your finger on a low fret and it was bouncing into the frets in front of it. It would hit that first fret that it hits and then hit a bunch of frets, then it would spring back up. The next time it comes down, it's still going to elastically spring past where it hits that first fret. The mass of the string will and its momentum will carry it past that point. So that's fret buzz. To have the right curvature in your neck to stop or at least minimize that fret buzz, um, we adjust the truss rod. There is some debate about how much relief should be in a neck. Uh, a lot of people will show you um, that you hold the string down at the first fret and at the 12th fret or the 14th fret or at the body joint fret and then you can tap it to see if there's a space and that's good you can see if there's a space you can certainly tell if it's touching the fret already and there's no space that's a problem the next either straight or as backbone needs to be corrected got to measure that space though if you want a precise action adjustment later that won't buzz um, so what I use is a relief gauge and you can buy um, store-bought relief gauges. I like mine because I can position it on the first, fifth, and twelfth fret of any guitar, any fretboard from a mandolin to a bass. But you can't measure the relief when the guitar is in the workbench because the weight of the guitar will change the bow of the neck. So you want to measure the relief in playing position and you want to set that relief typically for five or six thousandths on the low E and typically three or four thousandths on the high E. Now lower actions will have straighter necks with less relief and higher actions will have more relief. Um, basically any situation where the string excursion is greater will require more relief. So Thinner strings, lighter string gauges require more relief. Higher actions 
require more relief. Heavier strings, less relief. Lower actions, less relief. The range of relief goes from micro action guitars with actions of less than 3 64ths by less than 2 64ths. That's micro action. Um, you could have as little as 2 thousandths relief at the fifth fret on the low E and 1 thousandth on the high E. Um, normal electric guitar action would say be 4 64ths by 3 64ths at the 12th fret and that would require typically four or five thousandths of relief on the low E side and maybe two or three thousandths on the high E side. Um, there is some range that will work. It's not necessary to hit the mark on the nose. What is important is that that curve be greatest towards the top of the neck and diminish coming down towards the 12th fret, somewhere around the 12th fret. Earlier for lower actions, can be later for higher actions. That curve has to reverse and fall away just a little bit, a little bit being even a thousandth of an inch, although you'll see on some guitars, especially acoustic guitars, it could fall away a 32nd of an inch or more. Um, you check that with a straight edge. Uh, I use steric tri-square blades that are lapped on a granite surface plate, but you can buy a straight edge. But you need a good straight edge that's very straight. Check the tolerances on it before you buy it. You want to feel the first fret the most. Feel the second fret a little less, third fret a little less, and when you start getting down around here, you shouldn't feel the fret bump into the ruler, but you should be able to hang the ruler up on each fret coming down to around here where the ruler should start to float. Now, when you rock the ruler across the frets like this, if the ruler is straight, and the neck is curved, obviously, it's just going to touch on the ends. As you come down here where the neck becomes convex, now you should be able to rock that ruler on every single fret. And that's the fall off. The fall off should be even. And if it's even, there won't be any low frets in it. If there are, they may buzz. So that's the optimal configuration for a neck. Um, For acoustic guitars, specifications could be uh, action of 6 64ths by 4 64ths is typical at the 12th fret, with relief of 6 64ths by 3 or 4 64ths typical. Um, and that's the story of how straight a neck should be and why, and a little bit about the anatomy of a string buzz. Hope that cleared a few concepts up for you, and um, I'll see you on another YouTube.